Okay, um, this is going to be the recording for section 7.1. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see my papers. And then um, we'll go from there. Now, I did um, go ahead and go through the problems in the assignment already. And so what I've done is next to our examples in here, I've written like the comparison of the problems. So like those examples are from certain problems in the book, um, are in the homework. These are from different problems in the homework and so on and so forth. So we're going to use that as we go through this um, section. And then at the end, there's like three problems that were not on this um, note packet. So we're going to cover those separately at the very end. So first we're going to introduce trigonomic functions, um, angles, arc length, and circular motion. So there's quite a bit of information in this section, but we'll start at the beginning and go from there. Although it is a lot of information, this section probably won't take us as long as the um, decomposition of fractions. Um, so let's see, a trigonomic function, also called circular functions, are functions of an angle. They are used to relate the angles of a triangle to the lengths of the sides of a triangle. They are important in the modeling of periodic phenomenon among many other applications. We will begin by defining some vocabulary that we will use throughout this semester. For instance, a ray is a portion of a line that starts at a point V on the line and extends indefinitely in one direction. So it's kind of like a line that's been chopped off. Okay, so it starts at a point and then it continues. And it can continue in any direction. It doesn't have to necessarily be in this direction. And the starting point V of a ray is called the vertex. Okay, so the whole thing is a line going indefinitely in both directions. Here's a point on the line. It becomes the vertex when you only take the ray portion of that line. Okay. If two rays are drawn with a common vertex, they form an angle. One ray of an angle is called the initial side and the other the terminal side. The angle is identified by showing, the angle formed is identified by showing the direction and the amount of rotation from the initial side to the terminal side. If the rotation is counterclockwise, the angle is positive. If the rotation is clockwise, the angle is negative. So um, I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit so you can see what they're talking about. So here's a typical uh, two rays, right? You've got one ray going in this direction, another ray going in that direction. And the vertex is the point here. And there's an angle that's in between them, okay? And so they're labeling this one as the initial side and that one as the terminal side. So you start from the initial and then you see which direction you have to go to get to the terminal side, okay? So if you go counterclockwise, which is in this direction, then that is a positive angle. Now, here's the same pair of rays, but this time, instead of going up toward the terminal side, they went down and around to get to that terminal side. Because they're going clockwise now to get to the terminal side, it is called a negative angle, okay? And then the last one, you could potentially start here and then basically you open it all the way and then open it again some more. That is also going to be a positive angle. And you can rotate it around and around and around as many times as you want. Um, it'll still be positive if it's going in that direction. Similarly with the negative, if you keep rotating it over and over and over and over, it's still going to be negative if you're going in the clockwise rotation. Now, um, notice that it is quite common to use Greek letters to denote angles. There are, what are the names of these angles? 
This symbol here is alpha. You'll see me write it as this, okay? And then beta, I try my best, that's my beta. And then my gamma. So basically like a little R with an extra hook on the left, right? A B with a little longer tail at the bottom. And then this almost looks like a fish, right? <laughs> but those are the way I write alpha, beta, and gamma. So if you see these um, symbols, that's how I'm writing them. Another one is theta, which I just write it like a zero with a line through it. Um, is said to be in standard position if the vertex is at the origin of a rectangular coordinate system and its initial side coincides with the positive x-axis. So if you've got your initial side here on the x-axis and the vertex is at the origin, this is considered standard position. And it doesn't matter whether the angle opens in a positive direction counterclockwise or if it opens in a negative direction counterclockwise. Um, the position is still the same. The vertex is on the origin and the initial side is on the positive x axis. So here it says when an angle theta is in standard position, the terminal side will lie either in a quadrant in which I'm sorry. So it will lie within a quadrant, in which case we say that theta lies in a quadrant, or on the x-axis or the y-axis, in which we say that theta is quadra, quadrantal. I can't say that word. <laughs> quadrantal. I don't think I've ever used that word in all of my experience with pre-cal and calculus. So um, this little bit of information, I mean, it's good to know, but I don't think I've ever used it other than just reading it probably once somewhere in a book, okay? Um, but if they ever refer to those words, I guess they've referenced them once, so they expect you to remember that. Um, so here's another bits of information. So thus far in your mathematics career, you have probably measured angles in degrees. The 360 degrees representing one complete revolution counterclockwise, because that would make it positive, right? Around a circle. This means that one degree is equivalent to 100, one over 360 of a complete revolution, 60 degrees. Represents 60 out of 360, or one sixth of a complete revolution. From this, it follows then that a right angle is one fourth of a revolution counterclockwise and is 90 degrees. Okay, so that means if we're talking about the here, here's my vertex, here's my first ray and a 90 degree angle would be this. So my second ray would be on the positive y axis. And all they're saying here is that if you look at the whole thing, this is one fourth of the whole circle, right? Um, and then of course we know that a right angle is 90 degrees. Um, a straight angle, which is basically if you complete the line, so here's your initial side, and then it rotates all the way over here. So essentially it's just a line, um, but the angle there is 180 degrees, which is half of the entire circle, okay? Um, it's just saying what fraction, but I've already filled in what fraction, so it, that was the hint that a fraction was supposed to go in the blank. Now here's the first example. So it says, use the information from the expiration to approximate it is in. So this is a positive 135 degrees. Now we've already established that from here to here, this is 90 degrees. And then from here to here, it's 180 degrees. So I'm gonna mark here would be 90 degrees and here would be 180 degrees, okay? 
and the angle that they want me to mark is 135 degrees. So I know that that is going to be somewhere in between these two. What is in between 180, exactly in the middle? Um, oops, 45 plus 90. Ah, it's right exactly in the middle. So exactly in the middle would be um, that 135 degrees, okay? So use the information and identify which quadrant it in, is in. So what quadrant is this terminal side? That is, this is quadrant one and it goes counterclockwise. So this is quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. So I am currently in quadrant two. Now B is a negative, so it's not gonna be going counterclockwise, it's going to be going clockwise. So we know that the 90 degree angle will be here, but it's going to be negative 90. And if I keep going in the, op the negative direction, this would be negative 180 degrees. And they want me to go to 120, so it's probably right about but which quadrant am I in? I am in quadrant three this time. Okay, now, so that's something new that we're learning here. In a nutshell, we're learning that you go counterclockwise, you have a positive angle, you go um, clockwise and you have a negative angle, okay? And then we're being reminded about the labeling of our quadrants. So here's something new in addition to that. It says degrees, minutes, and seconds. When measuring angles and degrees, fractions of a degree are often represented in minutes and seconds. Note that the words minute and second used in this context have no immediate connection to how those words are used as amounts of time. So that's very important. Um, because these degrees, minutes, and seconds are not the same as the minutes on the clock and the seconds on the clock, okay? Um, and it says degrees, minutes, and seconds are used for things like latitude and longitude on topographic maps. And so it is important to know how to convert from degrees, minutes, and seconds to decimal form and the reverse. It says in a full circle, there are 360 degrees. Each degree is split up into 60 parts. Each part is called minute, okay? So one minute is 1 60th of a degree, okay? So 60 minutes equals one degree. 60 minutes equals one degree. One second is denoted by one with a double apostrophe is one sixtieth of a minute, okay? So now you're talking about the second. Um, another thing you could say is that 60 seconds is um, one minute, but we know one minute is equal to one over 60 degrees. I better be careful with when I say that. I will talk about conversions, conversions in a second. And we'll use these, fraction, these um, facts because when you cleverly multiply by one, you're not changing the value, right? But you can multiply by one to create a conversion. So instead of multiplying by one, you could multiply by an expression here that is equivalent to another expression there. So for instance, if I were to try to convert something, I could multiply by one degree over 60 seconds, or I could multiply by 60 seconds over one degree, depending on what I was trying to convert to, right? And the same thing with the seconds. I could use this in a conversion by using 60 seconds over one minute, or one minute over 60 seconds, depending on what I'm trying to convert to, okay? 
So that's going to be important in just a bit. Now, here's our example. It's a lot like number five on the assignment 7.1 in my labs plus. So they're here, they're asking us to convert to um, decimals to decimal form. So they've given us the degrees, the minutes, and the seconds. And so what's important to do here is to know that this is the same as saying 45 degrees plus 10 minutes plus 15 seconds. And 45 degrees is already in degree mode. 10 seconds can be converted into degrees by using this conversion. The fact that one degree equals um, 60 seconds, right? And we could also convert this into, um, well, we can say one minute is 60 seconds. But then we can also say that one degree is one minute. And so what happened, and I'm sorry, not one minute, 60 minutes. So then here, the minutes will cancel as units, and I get 45 degrees plus um, 10 divided by 60 is going to be 0 0.166 seven degrees plus here we get 15 times one times one which is 15 divided by 60 times 60 um, decimal which is 0 0.0041667 and the seconds will cancel the minutes will cancel leaving me with degrees okay so if I take those responses and I add them together, so I'm gonna get the previous answer plus 45. I end up with 45.1708333 degrees. It does say round of four decimal places. So one, two, three, four. I don't really need that part of the number. So this is what we get is our final answer. Now, same thing for the other one. So we're going to take 34 degrees plus 15 minutes and use the conversion for one degree is equal to 60 minutes plus 27 seconds and use two conversions. One minute is 60 seconds and one degree is 60 minutes. So we get 34 degrees plus 15 divided by 60 is 0 0.25. And then 27 divided by 60 times 60 is 0 0.0075. So we get 34 plus 0.25 plus 0 0.0075. I get 34.2575 even, and that is already rounded to four decimal places. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and convert in the other manner. Okay. So going the other way around. This one's a little bit different. Just like these, I just split it up by adding. In order for me to do the other problem, I actually have to subtract. So since I know this is 12.87 degrees, I already know that I can take away the whole number, right? And I get 0 0.87 degrees. That tells me that I am going to have 12 degrees for sure. I just need to figure out the minutes and then the seconds for this particular problem. And I wrote those backwards. I need to find out the minutes and then the seconds. Okay. So in order for me to find out the seconds here, I'm going to multiply by one degree over 60 minutes first. Okay. What do I get when I do that? So 0.87 times one 
divided by 60. Or no, I'm sorry. This is wrong, right? The degrees are not going to cancel if I do this, and I'm not going to end up with the minutes. So this fraction is upside down. So remember in the previous page, I said you could multiply by one degree over 60 minutes or the other way around. It depends on what you're trying to convert it to. And so since I'm trying to convert it to minutes, I want to have the minutes in the numerator and then the degrees in the denominator. That way this unit can cancel with that unit and I am left with the minute unit. So 0.87 times 60 is 52.2. So I ended up with 52.2 minutes. So again, I'm going to subtract the whole number. And that's how many minutes I have. But this decimal number, I'm going to convert it to seconds now. So since I want seconds, I'm going to have, um, my 60 seconds is equivalent to one minute. So the minute symbols will cancel and I get 0 0.2 times 60, which is 12 seconds. And so now I know that I'm going to end up with 12 seconds here. And so we're gonna do the same thing for the next problem. It's 1.53 degrees. So we're going to take away the whole number one and we get 0 0.53 degrees. That means I already know what the degree measurement is. That whole number is one. Then I'm gonna multiply that by one degree equals 60 minutes. And I get 31.8 minutes. So I'm gonna take away the whole number and that gives me 31 minutes. And then I'm gonna multiply this by one minute equals 60 seconds. And I get 48 seconds. So this becomes 48 seconds. And that is the final answer there. Okay, now we're gonna talk about radians. Okay, so there are two ways that you're going to receive your angles, and there's two measurements. One is in degrees, which is the one we're used to, and there's two different forms to have an answer in degrees. We already know just straight degrees, decimal degrees, and then degree minutes and seconds. Okay, but um, there's another way to represent an angle, which is called radians. And so we need to talk a little bit more, more about that one. So radians represent another way of measuring an angle. This is the preferred measurement used in calculus, and it most certainly is, I can attest to that. The radian measure theta of an angle is the measure of the ratio of length of the arc it spans on the circle to the length of the radius, or the angle equals the arc length divided by the radius. Okay, so here's my arc length, and they use the letter S to represent arc length. And then here is the radius R, okay? And then that angle is right here. And how do they describe that angle? They describe that angle by the arc length divided by the radius, okay? Um, since radius and arc length are measured in the same units, um, theta or radians do not have units of length. This is important. It does not have a, a unit of length. Okay, so if the only measurement, the only measurement you end up with is radians, normally we don't say radians, we just say the number. So if I end up with calculating something and I get two radians, I usually just say the answer is two. Okay. Um, but if you end up calculating your measurement and you end up with your measurement as radians times feet, 
we don't say the answer is radians times feet. We just say it's feet, okay? So that's why it's important. Now that's a little bit different than if you have um, radians per second, then you would need to write the radians because that's in the numerator, where seconds is in the denominator. Um, give me one second. Okay, so because of that equation, we have the following formula now. So in order to find what is called arc length, that arc, we just basically multiply the previous um, equation by r on both sides. And so we end up with this equation. So this is gonna be very important because this is basically our formula to calculate arc length, okay? So the next example says, find the length of an arc of a circle of radius four meters. So this is telling me that my R is four meters, subtended by a central angle of 0 0.5 radians. So that means my theta is 0 0.5. So when I go to figure out my arc length, all I need to do is R times theta. So in this case, my arc length is four times 0 0.5, which happens to be two. Now it was four meters times 0 0.5 radians, which would mean meters, because you don't use this as a measurement of length. So example four says you walk five miles around a circular lake. So here's the circular lake. Let's just draw the axes there for a central. Um, so you start here and you walk around five um, miles. It says give an angle in radians, which represents your final position relative to your starting point if the radius in of the lake is two miles. So let's say that right here, this is my radius, that's two miles. So I know my radius, which is two, and I even know the arc length, which is five miles. What they're asking me to do is find the angle in radians. So I'm gonna say my angle is S over R from the previous page. So in this case, that becomes five over two, or 2.5 radians. Now you don't have to write the word radians, but I just wanted you to understand that that is in radians like they asked for. So converting from degrees to radians. What you wanted to know, you, what if you wanted to know your position on the lake measured in degrees? What is the connection between radians and degrees? Let's explore this. In a circle, the outside measure of one complete revolution can be represented by circumference, or the formula C equals two pi r. This means that one revolution around the unit circle, the unit circle means that r is equal to one. So then if I plugged in a one here, I would just get two pi. So we're assuming we're talking about the unit circle, right? In degrees, what is the length of one revolution around the circle? In degrees, we know in order for us to go all the way around, it's 360 degrees. So this means that one revolution around a unit circle is two pi radians or 360 degrees. Simplifying this relationship by dividing both measures by two leaves us with, there should be really a comma there, leaves us with the following equality, 180 degrees equals pi. Use the equality found in part three to, con to find conversion formulas for degrees and radians. So one degree, remember you wanna put these in the correct order, one degree equals pi over 180 radians. And one radian, which means a radian number would go at the bottom, 
equals 180 over pi degrees, okay? We're gonna use this to convert these measurements. So if I convert from degrees to measurements, we want the degrees in the denominator and the radian in the numerator so that the degrees can cancel and I have 80 pi over 180 and it says round to two decimal places. So I'm going to use my calculator and say 80 pi divided by 180. It gives me the exact number, but it wants me to put in decimal, so I converted it. So I get 1.3, actually that would make it 1.4 radians. Now 140 will gain pi over 180 degrees, so the degrees would cancel. 140 pi divided by 180, let me put it in decimal, is 2.44 radians. Even if there's a negative, it doesn't matter, it just means that you're gonna end up with a negative radian. So 30, or you can put negative 30 pi over 180, is negative 0 0.05 radians. And then 100 times pi over 180 degrees is 1.75 radians. Okay, now the shifting or whatever you want to call it. So numbers uh, one and two are going to be like this on the homework. Three and four are going to be converting the other way around. So they're going to give us the radian and they're going to ask us for the degree measurement. You have two problems that have to do with arc length. However, in number eight, they're going to give you a degree. So they may tell you that the radius is 50 degrees. So you'll have to use this conversion to take the degree and turn it into a radian before you're allowed to plug it into this arc length formula because theta has to be in radians, okay? So that was one thing that I wanted to point out with that problem. This one, they did give us the angle in radians, so it wasn't an issue, but I did notice that there was a homework problem number eight where they want the same answer, they want to know the arc link, but they're going to give you degrees, which means you have to convert it first. The formula is only used for radians. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert these radians into degrees now. So that means we need the radians at the bottom and the degrees at the top. And notice that the pi's cancel here. So I end up with negative three times 180 divided by five. Oops negative three times 180 divided by five is negative 64.8 degrees. Here, 180 degrees divided by pi, pi's cancel, I end up with 60 degrees. 180 degrees over pi, those cancel. We get 480 degrees. And then here, there is no pi, it's just two radians but we still use the same measurement. Remember, pi is the radian, so it has to go in the denominator. And then we end up with um, two times 180 divided by pi gives me 114.6 one, um, It's 591, oh, I guess it could be 59. That could be, it should be, degrees. Okay, so now it says, going back to example four, if you walked around and you went to Circular Lake with a radius of two miles, your final answer, what would it be in degrees, okay? So I know that I've gone 2.5 radians, that's the answer we received previously. We would just multiply by 180 over pi. Um, so you get 2.5 times 180 divided by pi. I get 143.24 um, degrees, okay? So my image was actually a little bit wrong because I had the terminal side over here somewhere, but it would actually have to be longer than 90 degrees. So the terminal side would actually be this. So if this was the lake, 
and the radius here is two, which that's also the radius there is two, but I walked around the lake five miles, um, it would have to look like this. Now, I didn't know how far the thing was gonna open um, because I was trying to find that angle. So I just drew a random image, and then once I know what it is, um, radians, you can't necessarily picture some of the times. So it's nice to put it in degree mode so then you can visualize where it is. Now that I know that it's 143 degrees, I know that it opens beyond that um, Y axis. So here we're gonna convert some pretty typical fractions. We use these a lot. So we already know that 180 degrees is pi. We already know that 360 degrees is two pi. We already know that pi is 3.14, this is 6.28. So we're just, and zero would be zero, right? Um, it didn't move at all. So let's do some of the other ones. So 30 um, times, so if you're trying to get degrees, you're gonna have to divide by the degrees, the 180 degrees, and then the pi on the top. So we get 30, pi divided by 180. Ooh, I have an extra number in there. 30 pi divided by 180. And I get pi over six. If I hit the double arrow, it'll give me the decimal form. So 0 0.52. Then 45 pi divided by 180 gives me pi over four, double arrow, 0 0.79. 60 pi divided by 180 is pi over three, and the decimal is 1.05. 90 pi over 180 is 1.57, or pi over two. And then 270 pi over 180 is three pi over two, or 4.71. Okay, now example nine tells us to complete the angle measures of the unit circle below. And they tell us that this angle is pi over six, pi over four, pi over three. And they want us to fill in the whole thing. And so what I've done is I've separated it into two parts, okay? So one part is gonna go by the measurement of fourth. So I know from here to here is 180 degrees, which means from here to here is one pi. And if I cut it up into four equal parts, one, two, three, four equal parts, each one of those parts is one fourth of a pi. And so then what that means is that this is one pi over four, this being zero, one pi over five, four, 2 pi over 4, which reduces to pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, which reduces to pi, 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, which reduces to 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, and then 8 pi over 4, which is the same as 2 pi. Okay? So they want us to do all of those measurements. Now I've just done them all actually just by counting. So all these in blue. So this one's here, the axes, and then the ones that chop it up into four equal pieces. So pi over four, this would be pi over two, three pi over two, we know this one's pi, um, five pi over two, or I'm sorry, I'm saying over two, it's five pi over four and three pi over four. Then six pi over four, which was three pi over two, and then seven pi over four is already there. Now, the other measurements that I didn't use along with the axes themselves, okay? So here's the axes themselves. And I know that from here to here is 180 degrees. Okay, so I'm gonna cover that up. Just knowing from here to here, the flat line, from there all the way around to there is 180 degrees. And so what I've done is I've cut up 
the rest of the group into six pieces. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six equal parts. So each one of those is a sixth of a pi, okay? And then all I did was extend that line, extend this line, extend that line, so on and so forth, right? To get all of the angles there in this version of the circle, okay? So here again is zero because it hasn't opened up at all. And then this is pi over six. This is two pi over six, which reduces to pi over three. Three pi over six, which reduces to pi over two. Four pi over six, which reduces to two pi over three. Five pi over six, and then six pi over six, which reduces to pi. Seven pi over six, eight pi over six, which reduces to four pi over three. 9 pi over 6, which reduces to 3 pi over 2. 10 pi over 6, which reduces to 5 pi over 3. 11 pi over 6, which does not reduce. And finally, 12 pi over 6, which is the same as 2 pi. So then if I fill in the red angles, we have pi over six, pi over three, pi over two, this would be two pi over three, five pi over six, pi, seven pi over six, four pi over three, three pi over two, five pi over three, 11 pi over six, and then zero and two pi again. Okay, so really the entire unit circle encompasses both of these sections together, okay? So if you were to lay this one on top of this one, this is the image that you end up with. And notice that this y-axis is both red and blue, and the x-axis is both red and blue, okay? And so that is how you'd use a unit circle. So me personally, when I draw my own unit circle, is I start off with this, so I just draw the axes, and then I draw a giant circle in my axes. I, I'm horrible at drawing circles, by the way, but I try to draw a circle <laughs> on my axes. And then I just start cutting this up into two pieces, and I cut this one up into two pieces, and then I label all of them. And then once I'm done with that, I just go right in between in this first quadrant and cut in another one, and I know these are my pi force, okay? And then right in between these two, I cut in another one, and that's the other part of the phi force. And then the axes themselves are, of course, the other pieces. So 0, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4, 8 pi over 4. And I go through the whole thing like that. But that's how you build your own unit circle, is using these two pieces together. Okay, that's going to be important. Um, yeah, it's nice to have your unit circle there, but when you get in calculus, you're really not going to want to sit there and go back to the unit circle every single time. You're going to eventually, at some point in this class, you're going to want to commit that thing by memory, or you're going to want to learn to develop it on your own, okay? Um, it will become very, very, very important, and we're going to build on that. So that was just the angle measurements. Eventually, um, we're going to actually figure out the links of the initial and terminal sides um, and the sines and cosines. We'll get to that, right? That's the trick part of pre -cal. Um, But we will get to that eventually. So that will also build on our unit circle. So it's good to just get the angles down first so that we can build on that to continue um, with the information in this class. So the next idea they have is finding the area of a circle. So from geometry, it is known that the area of a sector of a circle is proportional to the measure of the central angle. Consider the circle to the right to explore this. Let the central angle be the entire circle or two pi radians. 
What is the area of this sector, which represents the area of the whole circle? We already know from geometry that the area is pi r squared. Now using the proportion of yields, right? Pi r squared is the area of the sector, the whole circle. Then two pi is the, rate, the, the angle of the whole circle. So we know this information, right? Um, but if you take this information, you can start to solve for the area of the sector, okay? So if you multiply both sides by theta, you end up with theta times pi r squared over two pi. The, the, the pi's will cancel and you'll end up with um, theta times r squared over two, which you can rewrite as one half times r squared theta. And so that's the, the formula that we'll be using to calculate area, okay? And again, remember that theta is in radians. So your angle must be in radians in order to calculate the area. So number seven, um, I'm sorry, number 11 in the homework is a lot like example 10. So it says, find the area of the sector of a circle with the radius of five, and the angle of 40 degrees. So we cannot use 40 degrees in the area formula. So we're gonna have to multiply by pi over 180 degrees to cancel the degrees. And we end up with 40 pi over 180. Um, I'm gonna use the fraction version just because you never wanna round too soon. So I'm gonna use this fraction. So then my area is one half times r squared, and it's in feet. So if by square feet, I'm gonna end up with feet squared. And then my radians, which is two pi over nine. So I'm gonna type this whole thing in my calculator, one over two, and then five squared times two pi over nine. And so what is on my paper looks exactly like what I have in my calculator. So I'm going to hit enter. And I'm going to change that to a decimal because it does say round to two decimal places. So I get 8.73 feet squared. All right. Okay. So now the next thing that we have to talk about is finding linear speed of an object traveling in circular motion. So think of this as a bicycle, right? When you have a bicycle, here's your wheel. And then as you're traveling, the wheel is turning. And so then it's rotating. And as it rotates, you're kind of moving along this line, okay? And so when they say linear speed, it's like how fast you're moving this way. Um, your angular speed is a little bit different. That's like how fast you're moving around the wheel itself, like how fast the wheel is spinning. So there's a difference between how fast the wheel is spinning, which is angular speed, and how fast the whole wheel is moving along the line, okay? So those are two different um, measurements of speed. And so that's what we're going to develop here. So um, it says, recall the relationship between distance, rate, and time. Distance equals rate times time. And if I divide both sides by time, I get the formula that rate is distance over time. And rate is just another word for speed. So speed is your distance over your time. Now, in terms of the distance round, around a circle, it is called arc length, S, okay? So if V is defined as linear speed and T defined as time, the following formula for speed around a circle from the formula above for speed, distance, and time. So this is what you end up with. You end up with your uh, linear speed, which is used by V, equals your arc length, which is the distance over time, okay? So S over T. Now, so that's how you find your linear speed. Now, um, we do know that S can be calculated by doing R times theta, right? We learned that the arc length, that's how you calculate the arc length. 
So that's another formula that you can use. It just depends on if they give you the arc length or if they give you information so that you can find the arc length, okay? It all depends on the problem. Now it says this formula finds how fast a position along the circumference of a circle is changing. So um, to find how fast a central angle is changing in as an object travels around a circle, angular speed, which is omega, which looks kind of like a really bubbly um, W, must be used instead of using S. We will use a central angle theta, okay? So the angular speed omega of an object is the angle theta measured in radians swept out or divided by the elapsed time. That is that omega equals theta over t. Okay, so it says in summary, linear speed measures how fast the position of an object is changing and angular speed measures how fast the angle is changing. Um, an object traveling in a circular motion has both linear and angular speed. Using substitution, it can be shown that linear speed is dependent on the radius of the circle and how fast the object is rotating. Okay. So um, all they've done is here, they took S over T, which we know is R times theta over T, and then separated that fraction into R times theta over T. And you realize that R is multiplied by omega. So essentially, you can get your um, linear speed, but linear speed also uses your angular speed. So with that, I have three problems that I want to cover that were not mentioned in the notes, okay? So one problem is, um, it says the 10 minute hand of the clock is 12 inches long. How far does the tip of the minute hand move in 25 minutes? So if a clock is circular, right? Here I'm in the seconds and I'm going to draw the hand here. We know that this is the six, and that's 30 minutes, right? And then we have this is the three, that's 15, and then you have four and five. So basically, we want to know when it's hitting this part right here where the five is at. Okay. So we want to know um, this, how far it moved. We want to know that uh, arc length. Okay. So we're trying to find S. And we know that S is R times theta. And I do know the radius because from the center of the clock, I know that the minute hand is 12 inches. So we do know the radius is 12 inches. What we don't know exactly is the radiance, but we can calculate the radiance because we know that the whole entire clock is going to be two pi radians. 360 degrees, right? Those are the same. Divided by the 60 minutes on the clock. And it's not 60 minutes as in the little ticky thing like for degrees, right? This is actual minutes on the clock. We mentioned those are not related, okay? Um, so I'm going to take that and I'm going to multiply, since it's going to 25 minutes, I'm going to multiply it by 25 minutes, okay? And so what do I end up with here? I end up with um, 12 times 2 pi times 25 divided by 60. I end up with 10 pi, but it does, I think it asked me to round to two decimal places. So if I hit the double arrow, it's about 31.42. And the minutes have canceled. This is all just radians times inches. So I end up with inches. Remember, radians is not an actual measure of length. So I do end up with inches. Now, this problem here is the total arm and blade of a windshield wiper is 13 inches long and rotates back and forth through an angle of 93 degrees. The shaded region of the figure is the portion of the windshield cleaned by the 10 inch wiper blade. What is the area of the region cleaned? So we want to find this area here. 
In order to do that, we're actually going to have to take the larger angle and subtract the, um, the larger area and subtract the smaller area, okay? And what do I mean by that? When I mean the larger area, I mean the area of the whole thing minus the area of this one little sector, okay? So when I say of the whole thing, I'm going to use this 13 as my radius. So for here, R equals 13. And for this little part, since the windshield wiper itself is 10 inches, that means that this little part is only three inches. So for the smaller area, I'm gonna use three, okay? So then what is my formula? It's one half times the radius squared times the angle. But the angle must be in radians, not in degrees. So I have to multiply by pi over 180 degrees. So the degrees can cancel. Then I need to subtract 1 half times 3 squared. And again, the same angle, 93 degrees, times pi over 180 degrees so that those degrees cancel. So what do we end up with here? We end up with 1 half times 13 squared times 93 times pi over 180, close that parentheses, oops, not there, there. I get, I'm gonna use a decimal of that. I get 137.1566993 minus, I'm just gonna copy that previous step. And the only thing I need to change is that 13 needs to become a 3. And I'm going to use a decimal for that. 7.3042029. So then I'm going to take that previous decimal and subtract this decimal. And we end up with 129.85. And so it was, these are radians, 13 was in inches. So inches squared minus inches squared is going to give me inches squared. Okay, last problem. It says an object is traveling around a circle with the radius of nine meters. If 50 seconds, if in 50 seconds, a central angle of one seventh radian is swept out what are the linear and angular speeds of this object? Okay, so we need to have our two formulas here. So for our linear speed, um, that's going to be V, right? This is our linear speed. And for that, we were using, um, I think it was S over T, or you could be using R times theta over T. Since they did not give me the angle, they gave me the radius and they gave me time. Um, and they even gave me the angle of one seventh radian. So I have everything I need for this formula. So it's gonna be nine times one seventh over 50. Now this is nine meters times one seventh radians, which is not a real measurement of um, length and seconds. So when I'm done, this one won't affect anything. It'll just be meters over seconds. So nine times one seventh divided by 50, I get, um, and I think they want you to use fractions in this problem. So it'll be nine over 350 meters per second. And then for the angular speed, that one was the omega, which is just theta over time. So one seventh radians over uh, 50 seconds. Now here, if I didn't have a measurement at the bottom, if it were seconds over radians, I would just say the answer is seconds. But because it's radians on top, you actually do have to say radians per second. You can't have nothing per second. It doesn't make any sense, okay? So one seventh um, divided by 50 is actually one over 350. And that is the end of this section. So it didn't take quite as long as the partial fraction decomposition 
although there was a lot of information in this section. So it did still take us about an hour to do this, okay? Um, but now you should be able to go on and take on the homework assignment for 7.1.